Hey, 42 here. On the 1st of May 1960, a Soviet S-75 Davina surface-to-air missile smashed into an American U-2 spy plane somewhere over the region of Sverdlovsk. Not wanting to lose face either in front of the press or the Soviets, the US government concocted a cover story, claiming the plane was a NASA research craft that went down after getting into difficulties. They really went to town trying to make the deception as plausible as possible, explaining that the pilot had radioed in a problem with his oxygen supply shortly before contact with the plane was lost. They even went so far as to ground the US Air Force's entire fleet of U-2s ostensibly to check the oxygen delivery systems for faults. It was an excellent piece of deception, delivered convincingly. But there was one small problem. Actually, there were two really fucking massive problems. First, the plane's pilot, Gary Powers, had not, as the Americans believed, died in the crash. He ejected safely and was in the custody of the Soviets. Secondly, the U-2 spy plane, which was covered in more high-tech reconnaissance gear than a billionaire stalker, had survived the missile strike with relatively minor damage, and the Soviets could see all too clearly that this was no research craft. Seeing an opportunity to score a point against their Cold War rivals, the Soviets wasted no time parading both the pilot and large chunks of the spy plane in front of the world's press. To make matters even worse, the two superpowers had been due to meet for peace talks at a Paris summit just weeks after the plane was shot down. With the Americans made to look like mugs for planting such a public lie, and the Soviets furious that the Americans were spying on them right before the peace talks, the summit was cancelled, and the Cold War continued unabated for the next 30 years. All in all, the whole thing was a bit of a disaster for everyone involved. But there was one rather nice knock-on effect. The 1960 U-2 incident directly led to the development of what many people believe is the greatest aeroplane ever built. That's a pretty bold claim, but if you watch to the end of this video, trust me, you're going to agree. This is the story of the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, the invincible spy plane. A VPN keeps you safe and private whilst covering up everything you do online. And Surfshark VPN lets you travel the world virtually by changing your virtual location. Or if you're actually physically traveling, Surfshark lets you connect via your home country so you don't miss out on your home comforts, such as streaming video content from home that might be blocked whilst you're traveling. There are over 3,200 servers in 100 countries, so anywhere you go, you'll find a server that fits your needs. Surfshark VPN offers a multi-hop feature, so you can put two VPN servers between you and your online destination for even more privacy and security. And I love Surfshark's IP rotator feature, which constantly changes your device's IP address without losing your VPN connection. It's just really important to stay safe online whilst you're out and about, and that's why I use Surfshark VPN, so I can, for example, access my online banking safely, even on public Wi-Fi. There's no chance I'd ever do that without VPN. VPNs also keep your location and download history private, so you can send and receive files securely. Quite simply, Surfshark VPN is an essential tool, and by using the code 42, you'll benefit from an 83% discount plus three extra months for free. All you have to do is click the special link in the description below, so don't miss out. And thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. When the U-2 first flew in 1955, the US government believed its lofty 70,000-foot cruising altitude put it out of range of Soviet radar systems. As Gary Powers proved in 1960, that very much wasn't the case. In fact, Soviet radar technology was far more advanced than the Americans had ever imagined. And that was a serious problem. The Lockheed U-2 was relatively slow, with a large radar cross-section. If the Soviets could successfully track it, it was nothing more than a very expensive flying duck. The CIA invested serious cash trying to make the U-2 less visible to radar. But when those efforts failed, it became clear they were going to need a new plane entirely, 
one that would truly be invulnerable to Soviet air defence systems. Of course, building an invincible aeroplane was impossible, but it just so happens that the Americans had an aeronautical engineer who'd built a career out of making the impossible possible. His name was Kelly Johnson, and to give you an idea of the length and importance of his career, I can tell you that he designed the United States' first jet fighter, the first military aircraft to fly faster than 400 miles per hour, the first Mach 2 capable fighter, and the first aircraft ever to exceed Mach 3. Put simply, he is one of the most important figures in the entire history of aviation. At the time, he was head of Lockheed's advanced development projects, a department better known by its nickname, the Skunk Works. Johnson's team was relatively small, but comprised some of the finest aerospace engineering minds, not just in the US, but the entire world. Together, Johnson and his merry band of geniuses came up with a plane that can only be described as a miracle of engineering. The first iteration of that aircraft was known as the A-12, and it was like nothing that had ever been built before. It was developed under a cloak of absolute secrecy, and first took to the skies in the early 60s, where it was tested at some place called Groom Lake, though you might know it by another name, Area 51. It was this plane, and others like it, that helped build Area 51's reputation as the home of secret alien technology. And it isn't hard to imagine why. The A-12 wouldn't have looked out of place in a Ridley Scott space epic. By the way, if the name A-12 sounds familiar, you might be thinking of one of Elon Musk's children, who's called... Um... Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've no idea. The A-12 part of this poor kid's designation is a tribute to Musk's favourite plane, the SR-71, which is ultimately what the A-12 became. To begin with, there were three different variants. The regular A-12 was a straight-up reconnaissance plane, but there was also an interceptor, the YF-12, that was equipped with air-to-air -air missiles, and the particularly badass M-21, which came with a detachable unmanned drone. But none of these planes ever really, well, took off, because waiting in the wings was the A-12's successor, the SR-71, nicknamed Blackbird for its striking paint job. Although, little known fact time, that paint was actually an extremely dark shade of blue. Capable of cruising 16 miles above the surface of the Earth at more than three times the speed of sound, the SR-71 was the perfect spy plane. It was one of the first built with a stealth design that dramatically reduced its radar signature. And it flew so high and so fast that ground fire couldn't touch it. By the time Soviet radar systems locked on and SAM installations fired, it was simply too late. The SR-71 was long gone. During three decades of active service, an estimated 4,000 surface-to-air missiles were fired at the SR-71. Not a single one hit its mark. The Blackbird was such a revolutionary aircraft that almost the entire thing had to be built from scratch using new technology. Air temperatures at cruising altitude were in the region of minus 85 degrees Celsius. But the SR-71 flew so fast that friction with the thin atmosphere generated temperatures of beyond 300 degrees Celsius across its frame. When a Blackbird landed after a flight at Mach 3, its hull was so hot you could cook your dinner on it, although I'm pretty sure that was frowned upon. Regular aviation aluminium would begin to soften if exposed to such extreme heat, so the SR-71 was built almost entirely from a titanium alloy. That was something that had never been done before, and a whole new set of fabrication tools and methods had to be invented before they could even start. The incredible heat generated when this plane was cruising at almost three and a half times the speed of sound caused other problems too. The airframe expanded by almost a foot as it warmed, so all the plane's panels had to be fitted with plenty of play. That extra wiggle room meant the SR-71 steadily leaked fuel whilst on the ground, 
because the fuel tanks didn't seal properly. Incidentally, there happened to be a bit of a shortage of titanium in the US at the time, which was particularly unfortunate because the vast majority of the global supply came from the Soviet Union. Buying direct clearly wasn't an option, so the CIA had to establish a number of dummy corporations to get Skunk Works what they needed. The first SR-71s went into service in 1966, about seven months before the England football team won the World Cup. Which is completely irrelevant, but it's always nice to mention it. In total, there were 32 SR-71s made. These planes flew so high that pilots had to wear special pressure suits to prevent their blood from boiling in their veins if the cockpit's integrity happened to be breached. And that incredible altitude meant the SR-71 could go where it pleased. Though, so far as we know, none were ever actually flown over the Soviet Union. By this point in the Cold War, tensions were simply too high to risk it. And besides, the Blackbird could do a surprisingly good job at gathering reconnaissance, even from outside of Soviet airspace. The planes were equipped with side-facing cameras that could scan 100,000 square miles of enemy territory in a single hour. For almost 30 years, the SR-71 ruled the skies, an untouchable phantom that would occasionally coalesce on enemy radars before disappearing into the ether. We'll likely never know which missions were flown and where, but it's thought that SR-71s were used all over the world and in almost every major war zone. But by the 1990s, the use case for this most impressive machine was beginning to look a little shaky. For all its technological brilliance, the SR-71 had one fatal flaw. It lacked a live data feed, meaning any intelligence it gathered couldn't be analyzed until the craft was back at base. The existing planes could always have been upgraded, sure, but emerging technologies like spy satellites and unmanned drones could do the same job more efficiently. In the end, a combination of these new technologies, politics, and the phenomenal running costs of the SR-71 saw it retired. Though plenty of senior figures in the Air Force considered that move to be a grave mistake. After all, spy satellites could be slow to get into position, and unmanned drone technology was still in its infancy. But after briefly being brought out of retirement in 1999, the SR-71 was mothballed for good shortly afterwards. The Blackbird is a relic from another era, a spy plane built almost 60 years ago that's long since been replaced by newer, more advanced models. Replaced, but never surpassed. To this day, the SR-71 remains the fastest air-breathing aeroplane ever built, and it still holds numerous point-to-point -point records, including the fastest flight from New York to London, in 1974, it made the journey in one hour, 54 minutes, a full hour faster than supersonic speed demon Concorde. There's something almost mythical about this aeroplane. Those who built it talked about it in hushed tones, and the pilots who flew it were simply in awe. In the words of US Air Force Colonel Jim Watkins, at 85,000 feet and Mach 3, it was almost a religious experience. If you want to see an SR-71 for yourself today, your only chance is to visit one of a select few museums around the world that were lucky enough to get one. But here's the good news. A successor is in the works. Commonly referred to as Son of Blackbird, the SR-72 could fly as early as 2025. As for whether it will live up to the legacy of its progenitor, only time will tell. Thanks for watching.